If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Praise God. Well, good morning, Resonate Church family. Good morning. Good morning to you. I want to take this opportunity to welcome our Hayward campus. Hey, let's give our Hayward campus a big round of applause. I want to welcome as well our brand new Oakland campus. Oakland campus, we're so glad you are here with us this morning. And online campus, let's give it up for them as well. We are so glad that you are here, and I am so glad about this opportunity to continue on in our teaching series, Heal Our Land. Heal Our Land. Now, we've been saying ever since the beginning of this series, week one, that we had two purposes for this teaching series. We hope that by the time this teaching series is through, that you would experience personal revival and reawakening in your life, that you would experience a personal wake-up revival of your love for God and seeing God's love for you in fresh and new ways. And not only personally, we, we pray that we would have a corporate revival across all of our campuses, not just Resonate Church, but the Big C Church in the Bay Area, in California, in the United States, and around the world. How many of you would love to see the beauty of God's grace revived all across the nations? Yeah, we want to see that. And so that was our goal as a leadership team and teaching team for this series but I want to start out by asking, and I want to ask all of our campuses this morning, do you want to see revival? It's one thing for us to have a goal for this series, but do you have a goal for yourself to see the beauty of God reawakened in your life? Do you want your heart to be revived to the goodness of God? Are there ways in which, if you're being honest, maybe you've been asleep at the wheel as it relates to your Christianity, and you would say, you know what, I want to wake up. I want to be rejuvenated. I want to be revived. And you might say, well, um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be revived. I don't know if, if that's what I want. So I want to help us this morning by asking some questions that maybe might stir up some need and desire for personal and corporate revival. And so maybe instead of asking the question, do you want revival? Maybe I'll ask this question. How is the health of your spiritual life? Resonate church family at all of our campuses. I'm talking to you, Hayward. I'm talking to you, Oakland, online right here in Fremont. Three weeks into the new year, how is the health of your spiritual life? Notice, I'm not asking, have you read your Bible every single day? I'm not asking if, if you plan on joining an MC or you've committed to being in church every single Sunday. I'm asking, how is the health of your spiritual life? And you might say, I, I don't know. How, how do you answer a question like that? Oh, praise God. I'm glad you asked. I've got some more questions to ask you to maybe help you diagnose how healthy your spiritual life is. And here's the first question I want to ask. Do you live with a deep sense of joy for God's grace for you? Praise God. Praise God. We've got... We've got one person here in Fremont. I don't know if there was anyone in Oakland or anyone in Hayward or online, but do you live with a palpable sense of joy for God's forgiveness and love and mercy in your life? In recent days, have you not only known that you were forgiven, but you felt that you were forgiven? In recent days, have you found yourself pondering the fact that 
because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you, you could be cleansed and you are cleansed of your sin. Has that been beautiful to you? Have you been enjoying the reality that through faith in Jesus Christ, you have gift righteousness? What does that mean? That means in the sight of God, because of your faith in the perfect life of Jesus Christ, you, when God looks down on you, he sees the perfect record of Jesus Christ over your life. Are you enjoying that reality, friends? You know, there would be some of us here today who would feel like through the first three weeks of 2024 that we are losing <laughs> I'm losing in my health because my health is bad. I'm losing in my relationships because some of my relationships are not where I'd like them to be. I'm losing financially. And I just want to let you know, Resonate Church family, if you have faith in Jesus Christ and have gift righteousness and are justified before Almighty God, we are winning. We're winning. We're winning. But are you living like you're winning? Here's a second question to consider. A second question to evaluate how healthy your life is. Do you desire for God's love to be experienced through you? It's one thing to enjoy the grace and love of God for yourself. But do you wake up with a desire to have your spouse experience the love of God through you? Do you wake up, ooh, I have a fresh opportunity for my kids to experience the love of God through me? For my coworkers, for the people in my MC as MC and missional communities and our groups begin to start this week, are you excited about the opportunity not just to be a part of a group, but to have God's love experienced through you to your coworkers? Do you have thoughts of like, man, I, I can't wait to be compassionate towards someone today. I can't wait to have a listening ear towards someone and be patient with someone else as God has been patient towards me. Finally, one last question to diagnose the health of our spiritual lives. Simply put, are you passionate about the advancement of God's kingdom? Does your heart break for people who are far from Jesus? Does your heart break for people who, if they don't call on the name of the Lord and put their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and have this gift righteousness, they will spend a Christless eternity apart from Almighty God? Does your heart break for that? Now, I know at this point, some of you may be feeling a myriad of feelings. Maybe you may be feeling guilt or condemnation, or maybe some of you are like, oh man, I'm good. My, my spiritual health is in a good place because to most of these questions, I would answer yes, and I praise God for you. But here would be one other way to kind of sum up these three questions, and it's language we use around here at Resonate, familiar to many of us. Are you enjoying grace are you embodying love? Are you engaging culture? I love those words not only because they make it clear how we make disciples here at Resonate Church, but they're also good words to use to help diagnose how we're doing spiritually. And I hope at this point, maybe we could see some reason for reawakening some reason for revival. See, for something to be revived, for something to be a reawakened, there has to be an assumption that that thing is somewhat dormant or sleepy or frozen, right? And so hopefully this morning we see, okay, there's a delta between where I'm at and I think where God wants me to be. But maybe some of you are thinking like, but why does this matter? Why does it matter if I'm enjoying grace, embodying love, or engaging culture? Like, I'm saved. Isn't that enough? I'm here for crying out loud. What more do you want from me? I'm here. 
And so let me just give you two reasons why I hope you lean in, two reasons why this matters before we jump into our text. Number one, this matters because the enemy desires to steal what Christ came to supply. And what did he come to supply? A full, abundant, joyful life. Why does this matter, the health of our spiritual life? Because Christ died and rose so that we could live a full, healthy spiritual life. You're familiar with the passage. What does Jesus say? The thief comes only. Resonate church family, you got to know there is an enemy and he has one objective. Steal the vitality of your spiritual life. Steal the joy from you. They're in Oakland. They're in Hayward. Be on guard. The enemy wants to steal what God has placed in you, what he died and rose again for. But Jesus said this, I came that you might have life to the fullest. This matters because we want to live for what God came for. Someone say amen. I want to live for what God came for, that I might have life to the fullest. Now, second reason why this matters, and we'll move along. And this might be offensive to some of you, and I don't have a Bible verse to support this. God just put it on my heart to say, let's see how this lands. (laughs) Unfortunately, why does this matter? Unhealthy Christians are ineffective missionaries. Unhealthy Christians are ineffective missionaries. You ever bought a car from someone who didn't care much about the car that they were selling to you? You ever go to a restaurant, you ask someone, hey, should I go to this restaurant? And they're like, oh, you know, whatever, the food's so-so. And then you're like, yeah, I think I want to go there. I think we respond to people and we lean in to people who are excited about the thing they're talking about. If you look at the uh, early Testament, New Testament church, we see people who were reaching their concentric circles of family and loved ones with the gospel. Why? Because they had an encounter with God and their life was obviously changed by it. And if we want to reach... In our generation, 72,000 new people with the gospel, 1% of the Bay Area. Come on, somebody. We're going to need to be awake. We're going to need to be healthy. We're going to need to be filled with the love of God so that love of God can radiate through us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, the good news is, if you're there in Oakland... Hayward online here in the room, and you're feeling like, geez, Ed, now I'm just depressed. (laughs) The good news is I didn't come to depress you here this morning. I, like you, look at these questions, and I say, man, I need some help. And the good news is the passage that we've been looking at over the course of these weeks in this series, Heal Our Land, it speaks directly into how we can experience revival and reawakening in 2024. And so I want to invite everyone at all of our campuses at this time to stand for the reading of God's word. And if you're new to Resonate Church, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We stand for the reading of God's word because there are many things that are going to be said from this stage today. But it's God's word, it's his words that are the only pure and perfect words that you'll hear this morning. And so with that says, God says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is the word of the Lord on this great Sunday morning at all of our campuses. We all say, amen, amen. You may be seated. Now, Pastor Jim, last week, if you missed the message, he did an excellent job at giving the context of this passage What was going on in that day, in that time when God spoke this word over the nation of Israel? Because that's what this word is. It isn't a blanket promise for the United States of America. Come on, somebody. 
This was spoken to the nation of Israel at a specific time for a specific purpose. But there are transferable principles from this passage that we can apply. There are what I like to call elements for creating an environment for revival. We see in this passage three elements, and let me give them to you really quick. Last week, Pastor Jim went over the first element. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves. That's the posture. If you want to see your spiritual life revived, if we want to see this Bay Area revived, the first thing we're going to need to have is a posture of humility. And Pastor Jim let us know so clearly, what is that posture of humility? Communicate to God. Basically, what you're saying is, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I can't have a vibrant, healthy, spiritual life on my own. If left to myself, I'll choose my own way. God, I need you. Well, the second element we're going to talk about today is the pursuit of prayer and seeking God's face. Then you got to come back next week. We're going to finish off the series with a pivot. You can't just have a posture. You can't just have a pursuit. You have to make the pivot of turning from your wicked ways. And so how are we going to learn about praying and seeking God's face today? Here's my outline, and then we're going to jump in. We're going to look first at the magnitude of seeking God's face. This is a big deal, friends. Seeking God's face is all throughout the scriptures. I can't wait to show you. Then we're going to look at the meaning of seeking God's face. What does it mean exactly to pray and seek God's face? And finally, we're going to get to a method. And so at all of our campuses, if you are ready to jump into the magnitude of seeking God's face, can you say, I'm ready? I'm ready. Oh, I didn't hear you in Oakland. I didn't hear you in Hayward. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Praise God, praise God. The magnitude of seeking God's face. Why is this such a big deal? Well, this wasn't just a one-time recommendation to the nation of Israel. We see the principle and the desire for God's face to be sought all throughout the scriptures. In 1 Chronicles, it said this way, now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. See, this isn't something we should just do every now and then. The scripture says, devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord. And look at what the prophet Zephaniah says. He says it this way, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You see how there's a connection between humility and seeking the Lord, not only in our second Chronicles passage, but the prophet Zephaniah says it that way too. And then look at some of the results of seeking the face of the Lord. Lamentation, Solomon writes it this way, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. How many of you would say, I want the Lord to be good to me. I want God to be good to me. Well, if you want him to be good to me, there's a promise here that says when we seek him, God is good to those who hope in him. He's not just good. Look at what the psalmist writes. He says, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. How many of you want to live blessed? Yes, yes. And so what do we do? We seek the Lord. I like what Moses writes in Deuteronomy. He says it this way, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. How many of you are thankful that in this game of hide and seek, God wants to be found? God can be found. This isn't an impossible mission. God is not saying, seek me, and then keeping himself hidden from you. He's saying, seek me. Look at what Jeremiah says. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. How many of you are thankful for a God who desires to be found by his people? Yeah, praise God for that. 
You might say, well, that's all in the Old Testament, Edward. I I don't think God calls us to to seek him after Jesus. Like that was old. Okay, well, I'll take you to the writer of Hebrews. He says it this way. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who at all of our campuses seek him. Seek him. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I saved my favorite for last. Hopefully we're seeing the magnitude of this. This is big. Psalm 14, 2 says it this way, the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. I'll never forget reading this verse years ago. And I don't know why. But for some reason, it just jumped off the page to me that God was giving a description of the type of person that he was looking for. And I remember in those early days of me following Jesus with either, I don't know what it was, maybe a childlike heart, a selfishness, I don't know. But I said to myself in those early days, man, I want to become and be the type of person that Almighty God is looking for. As he scours the earth for a certain type of person, I want to be found seeking him. Resonate Church, is this the type of people that we want to be? I heard some dating advice uh, one time. This was after I got married, so I didn't get to apply it. But I'm going to give you all the singles in the room. Where are all the singles at? At all of our campuses. Say, woo! Yeah, kind of, kind of. want to let. They don't want to out themselves. That's fine. That's fine. I'll give you this free dating advice anyways. I heard a pastor say one time, if you're single and you want to get married one day, your priority shouldn't be looking for the person, necessarily praying for the person. Your priority is to become the type of person that the person you're looking for is looking for. Oh, I think I got to say that again for the singles in the back. For the singles in the back, if you want to find the one, become the type of person that the person you're looking for is looking for. You may be wondering, why why can't I find the person I'm looking for? Well, you got to ask yourself, is the person I'm looking for looking for someone like me? Okay, why do I tell that silly story? Well, that's, that's free dating advice, but the truth is God in this passage, he tells us the type of person he's looking for. He's looking for someone who's seeking after him. I would love if there was a commitment as Resonate Church. Let's become the type of people that God is looking for. Let me sum up the magnitude. Why is the God seeking God's face such a big deal? Because God is looking for people who are looking for him. This is the type of person God is looking for. And we want to be found in 2024, all of our campuses, the type of person that God is looking for. Now, let's move on. Great. He's looking for someone who is seeking him, seeking his face. Well, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to pray and seek God's face? Well, the Hebrew word for face, when you look up, what what is the Hebrew meaning of the English translation face? It's actually a word that's more better translated presence. Presence. To pray and seek God's face is to pray and seek God's presence. Now, to understand things of the scriptures in this way, you know, I lean on theologians who've been studying the word more uh, for a longer time than I have, who are way more smart than I am. One of those guys is John Piper. I respect him so much as a Bible teacher. And his comments on this passage, this is what he has to say. He says, seeking the Lord means seeking his presence. Presence is a common translation of the Hebrew word face. Literally, we are to seek his face. But this is the Hebraic way of having access to God. To be before his face is to be in his presence. To be before the face of God is to be in his presence. How are we doing, Resonate Church family, with seeking the presence of God in our lives? 
Do you seek the presence of God? Now, maybe some of us would say right off the bat, yes, yes, I seek the presence of God. I want the presence of God. I'm someone who seeks the presence of God. And I wouldn't doubt at all of our campuses, there are probably many of you who do. Many of us who do, but as a warning, I want to make sure we don't fool ourselves into saying we seek God's face when we actually are seeking God's hand. Do you seek the face of God or do you seek the hand of God? Let me, let me throw up a, a bunch of other words maybe to help us tease this out a little bit. Instead of seeking God's presence, I think we tend to seek his power, his wisdom, his protection, his favor, his healing, his forgiveness, his provision. I think if we're being honest, we're probably more pursuant of the gifts of God rather than God as God himself. Pastor Ryan asked such a convicting question several weeks ago in one of his messages. He says, if you got to heaven and Jesus wasn't there, would you be okay? Oakland, Hayward, online, think about this. If you got to heaven and Jesus wasn't there, would you still be glad you made it? And that's not only a challenging question for when we get to heaven, I think it's a challenging question for now. If your heavenly father answered every single one of your prayers, if he healed your marriage, if he reconciled your relationship with your children, if he rescued you from the financial situation you're in, If he brought your family together in which you're crying out, if he healed your physical body in which you're crying out for physical healing, yet you did not have a sense of the palpable presence of God, would you be okay? I know I've had many seasons where I've been okay to do, quote unquote, effective ministry without the presence of God. I've been more consumed with, well, were there people in the room? (laughs) Were people engaging? Were people showing up in my marriage? Was it enough that we um, we were in harmony with one another? See, I'd be okay in our marriage in many seasons if we were in harmony, but I wasn't passionate about is is the presence of God right dead center in my marriage do you want just your children to to become Christians or do you want the presence of God to be in your home do we want to just have awesome weekend services where all the songs are sung perfectly and there's no stuttering on the slides come on somebody and and everything goes right but there's no palpable presence of God Do we want to reach 72,000 people and put them in brand new church plants all across the bay, but, but feel like, why does it feel like the presence of God is missing? I'm so thankful for Moses. I think he gives us a perfect example of what it looks like to desire God's face more than God's hand. He says it this way, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of this earth? This is a big deal. For those of you who might be new to Bible study, there was a time when the nation of Israel was to leave Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were given and they were going to go into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land that God had long promised that they would enter into. And look at what Moses says. I don't want to go into that land. I don't want your promise. I don't want your power. If I don't have your presence. As we kick off a new season of missional community groups, I hope our missional community group leaders and apprentices would say, I don't want us to meet tonight if the presence of God doesn't show up. I don't want us to have another weekend service if the presence of God doesn't show up. 
I don't want to have one more meeting with my coworker or try to evangelize my neighbor if the presence of God doesn't go before me. I don't want my body to be healed unless the presence of God is ever before me. I don't want nothing. I don't want nothing else except for the presence of God. And here's the deal. Something tells me, because I've experienced it in my own life, when I get the presence of God, I get everything else. I get his hand. I get his favor. And if I don't have my prayers answered the way I want them to be answered, I still have him. I still have him. Oh, he's beautiful. Okay, I got to move on. Why seek? Why seek? Hopefully I, I got you on what does it mean to seek God's face. That means to seek God's presence. Why seek? Emmanuel, God with us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Why do we got to go looking for someone who lives in us? Why would God tell the people in 2 Chronicles, seek my face, when the temple had just been built and he was going to dwell right there? All you got to do is walk in. Why seek? Once again, John Piper says it way better than I ever could. He says it this way, God's manifest, conscious, trusted presence is not our constant experience. His face, the brightness of his personal character is hidden behind the curtain of our carnal desires. This condition is always ready to overtake us. I want to say that again. God's manifest, conscious, trusted presence is not our constant experience. Wouldn't we all agree to that? The face of God, the presence of God, though he's in us, though he's all over the place, omnipresent, we don't always feel that presence. And so what do we have to do? We have to seek. We have to proactively pursue. I say it this way, to sum up the meaning of seeking God's face, it's to proactively pursue through and around the natural things of this world, the presence of God. It's to proactively pursue through and around the natural things of this world, the presence of God. I got to break down these words, through and around. Through. We just sang the song, God, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. I see you in the stars. I see you in the sky. But you know, when you see the stars, when you see that sunrise, you have to make the connection to seek God's face. You have to see that sunrise and say, God, you're all behind that. See, you have to read God's word. It just doesn't pop out all the time. You've got to meditate God's word and you've got to see it through it. You've got to say, God, where are you? You can't passively stumble upon the presence of God. You have to turn those pages and say, God, where are you in this passage? In your relationships, once again, as we enter into this MC season, we got to come in and we got to say, God, where are you at in this group tonight? Where are you? Can I just say I've personally been seeing the face of God, experiencing the presence of God in such a natural thing like confession and repentance. As I've had to confess in recent days to Pastor Ryan, Pastor Scott, my wife, some of my selfishness and some of my pride and the way I'm discontent, can I just tell you, as I've sat in some of those uncomfortable conversations, when I'm confessing the depth of my sinfulness, I have been able to, by God's grace, see God's presence even in confession and repentance. Through We've got to seek him through these things, but we also have to go around some things to seek God's presence. Someone say amen. You've got to go around your cell phone, somebody. Come on, come on, come on. You've got to go around your TV. You've got to go around Netflix. You've got to go under your boss, right? You've got to go around your annoying neighbor. You've got to go. You've got to move around some things to seek the face of God. Because there's so many distractions, like hacking things away in the middle of a jungle. So that's what it means to seek, to proactively pursue through and around the natural things of this world. Okay, let's 
take this thing home, a method. I get it, I get it. It's a big deal. God is looking for the type of people who are looking for him. Okay, I'm in. Seek God's face. What does it mean to seek God? Okay, it's to proactively pursue through and around. Okay, so so how are we going to do it? How are we going to do this as a church family? Well, we are going to pray and seek God's face specifically over the next 21 days through a season of prayer and fasting. We are going to fast and pray as one of the means, it's not the only mean, but one of the means to proactively pursue, one of the means to cut things out of our lives so that we could see God and pray and seek God's face. We're going to remove some distractions. What is the definition of fasting? I want to take you very quickly to it. Fasting is to abstain from foods certain types of foods for a certain amount of time for a specific purpose to seek God's face for a specific purpose we can go ahead and yeah put that definition of fasting on the screen it's to abstain from foods for specific this is not intermittent fasting like the world likes to practice fasting that's fine There's worldly fasting, but biblical fasting is when you abstain from food and other delights so you can pray and seek God's face with intention. And we're going to do that as a church family. Jesus talked about this. He said, when you pray, when you give, when you fast, he taught assuming that New Testament believers would fast and pray. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting? It's because he's like, because I'm here. (laughs) I'm the bread of life. Why do they need to fast? The feast is here. But when the bridegroom leaves, when I leave, then the disciples will fast. See, fasting is a way that we reawaken and revive our hearts for the Lord's return. And we say, this God is how much I want you. I'm going to abstain from natural bread so I could feast on spiritual bread. You, for a season of time. And so we're going to do this. I want to put this QR code on the screen. 21-day fast. It's called CALLED. And we've got a physical booklet for those of you on the way out who want to engage with this fast. I want to encourage you, if you're going to engage at all of our campuses, grab one of these booklets. Sign up for the fast. I want to encourage you over the next 21 days through the scriptures, by email, just short email every single day to encourage you as you seek God and pray and fast. Now, I know, first of all, there's a lot that could be said about fasting and prayer. Whole sermons could be on fasting and prayer. I don't have enough time. So get the booklet, download the resource, sign up for the fast, and that'll help prepare you. But I do just want to share a couple of things that I've learned as I've fasted and prayed now for the last 13 years. Now, I don't say that to brag or to boast. I say that to say I've failed at fasting more than I've succeeded. Come on, somebody. I have failed and failed and failed. I've said, God, I'm going to do a liquid-only fast, and by day three, I'm eating chicken McNuggets. (laughs) That fast went so quick from liquid-only to Daniel to just give me the meats. Yeah. Yeah. What was the fast? It was fast that it ended. That's what happened. It ended. The fast was fast. It was over. (laughs) You know what fasting teaches me? See, if my people will humble themselves. See, fasting, unlike any other spiritual discipline, will humble you. You know what fasting will do? It will show you that your stomach rules your life more than you know all of our campuses, all seriousness, friends, especially in these United States of America, 
I think we underestimate how much we go to food for comfort more than the comforter. Fasting helps to offset this. So I want to invite you. Let's fail through this fast together. Let's pick ourselves up. We'll eat. You'll mess up. And then you'll say, okay, but I'm going to get back up and go at it again. Why? Because God is worthy. Let's seek him together in this way. Now, I'm going to close with good news. Because I know at this point in the message, there are like a lot of emotions at all of our campuses. There's maybe some some guilt or condemnation. Oh my gosh, I have not been seeking God's face. Oh my gosh, the presence of God has not been the most precious thing to me. I've wanted his power. I've wanted his hand. I've wanted him to answer my prayers more than I've wanted him. And then maybe this last part about the fast, you're like, oh my gosh, this message was already too much. Now you're going to tell me not to eat? Get out of here. Get out of here, Ed. I just want to share some good news with you. From eternity past, Jesus Christ experienced the presence of God. He was face to face with God, unbroken for eternity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there was no need for Jesus from eternity past to seek God's face because in the triune God, they had perfect relationship with one another. Then on the cross, many of you are familiar with the passage. Matthew recounts it this way. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For those of you who are new to church and new to Bible study, one of the great mysteries of scripture is on that cross, the perfect son of God was cut off from his heavenly father. Almighty God had to turn his back on his son who he had been face to face with for eternity. Now, why did he cut himself off from Jesus? It wasn't because Jesus was distracted. It wasn't because he was living a sinful life. It wasn't because he was pursuing other things. It was because at that moment on the cross, Jesus was bearing your sin and my sin on his shoulders and perfect almighty God couldn't have anything to do with sin. And so Jesus Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So why is this good news to all of us in 2024? Well, because Jesus was forsaken by God on that cross in our place, we don't ever have to fear God turning his back on us. Because God turned his back on Jesus one time, we could be face to face with Almighty God for all time. Thank you, Jesus. I'm reminded when David prays after he had sinned against God, Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You see, what David feared, we never have to fear. We never have to fear God's presence being taken away from us. Why? Because it was taken away from Jesus. Praise you, Lord, for your gospel. Can you imagine? Let's imagine Resonate Church family. Marriages where God is present. Homes where God is present. Workplaces where God is present because we're seeking his presence. Church services, missional communities, church plants. We're above all. We are most passionate, not about God's power, but about his manifest presence among us. What a day. 72,000 people not just reached for God, but filled with the presence of Almighty God. Would we bow our heads and pray for that glorious day? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, 
I know this message can land in a lot of different places in our hearts. I've said a lot of things. And so, God, in only the way you can, could you begin to minister to our hearts right now, all of our campuses, the specific things that you want us to listen to. And if you're here in Fremont, Hayward, Oakland, online, and if you're like, if, you're, if you have a strong sense of this message is for me, God was speaking to me today. He was calling me back to himself. And if you would say, I want to be revived. I want to be reawakened. I want to humble myself in the sight of God like I've never humbled myself before. I want to invite you to stand because I want to pray for you. At all of our campuses, if you would say, I want to experience and seek the presence and face of God like I've never sought God before. At all of our campuses, would you stand now? I want to pray a special prayer just for you, that God would strengthen you, that God would meet you. Anyone else? This message was for me. This wasn't for my children. This wasn't for my neighbor. I don't hope someone else listens to this message. I needed to hear this message today. Anybody else, you would say, this message is for me. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I, I, I want to assume that there are people standing at all of our campuses. And God, I pray that you would be true to your word. You said that when we seek you, we would find you. And God, I pray in the days ahead that our Resonate Church family would have a fresh testimony of ways in which they found you, God, in their homes, in their marriages, in their college campuses, Lord, at their workplace, in silence and solitude, God. Revive us. Revive our hearts, Lord. Manifest yourself among us as we take communion now. As we sing a song across all of our campuses, God, would you be so kind? I'm just going to cry out as a humble servant. Would you manifest yourself among us and give us a taste of your presence? Like Moses said, we will not leave this place unless your presence goes before us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise you, Lord.